all yours, Louise. We have people joining in now. Yeah, we'll just see if people start joining. Hello, and you're all very welcome as you all join us from the waiting room where you've patiently been whilst Prakash and I have just been chatting in the green room to Jane and Philippa. I'll just give you all time to connect, to keep yourselves muted, but if you don't mind showing your camera, if you have the bandwidth, it's just really nice for all of us to be able to see who's joining us, see your lovely faces. We can already see regular attenders joining us, some new people, and you are all very welcome. And we'll crack straight on as everybody joins us with uh, a little warm up to say that today we're welcoming Jane Cunningham and Philippa Roberts to our group. You're both very welcome. They are the authors of this super book, Brand Splaining. And as I was just saying to them before, my daughter was just saying, oh, God, Mom, you're not going to be a feminist for another week now, are you? Because it's one of those books that just makes your blood boil. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I do want you to buy it. And I do want you to read it because uh, we'll invite Jane and Philippa to tell you about the book. But as I said in my post, are you being brand blamed to? The truth of it is most of us do not even notice how much of this is going on. And this is another one of those books that I feel has really, you know, cleared, <laughs> cleared my view all of a sudden and seeing everything differently. I wrote an angry letter to one of our Irish magazines as I turned the last page. And, <laughs> you know, I'm seeing television adverts and I'm just seeing them completely differently. So I'm not going to waffle on here. We want Jane and Philippa to be doing the talking. So maybe, uh, Jane, you'll join us first. And why don't, for those of the people joining us, which will be most of them who, who haven't read the book, just give us a rough sort of outline of the book. What is the gist of the book? Absolutely. The, the, the book is, um, I mean, we, we, the, the, the book comes in three parts, really. And I guess that the, the purpose of the book really was um, over the course of the last 15 years, Philip and I've been researching female audiences. Um, do you want to hop in there, Philippa? Jane, your bandwidth is low and we're just having a little problem hearing what you're saying. Do you want to just tag team with her, Philippa? Yes, of course, of course. I couldn't really hear what she was saying, so I'll just begin right at the beginning again, if that's all right. So Jane and I run a, a market research mm -hmm. agency and our kind of specialism is, is female audiences and in particular, I guess, how um, brands and marketing connects or doesn't connect with female audiences. And um, when we first set up our business 15 years ago, it was really um, it's quite, well, all of the sort of sexism and the, and the stereotyping was very much up front and, and in the open and pretty visible and, and in lots of instances sort of plain as the nose on your face. Um, and as we sort of over the 15 years when we've been researching, there's been some very sort of amazing developments that have happened in the world of women. There's been the whole rise of fourth wave fem feminism. There's been all the impacts of Me Too. There's been this, you know, growing awareness of intersectionality. There's been all the sort of blurring around gender. It's been all these, you know, huge changes. And we've sort of noticed uh, and in the sort of marketing space, there's also been fem empowerment and femvertising. So loads of stuff has happened in the 15 years that we've been working. Um, but what hasn't happened is that brands still continue to explain to women what it is that they should be, how they should be different from from what they are and still tells, tell them how to be and how to behave and still speak to them from a place of authority and often male authority. And, and 
that hasn't really changed. What's happened is that the stuff has kind of gone down below the radar and got more kind of sneaky and surreptitious and a bit sly often in the way in which it all gets done. And so after having worked in the space for 15 years, we felt that the what was needed was a kind of state of the nation analysis really of where things have got to, how women had changed and over that time and how marketing had or hadn't changed. Um, and so we conducted, um, well, we pulled together all the research that we'd been doing over the uh, 15 years and all the sort of findings from it. And then we did, we did a big quant study with Mindshare, which was with women in 14 different countries. I think it was about 14,000 sample in the end. And then we did a, bit, a huge kind of chunk of content analysis. And um, from all that work, we, co I guess, constructed a thesis, which, which is played out in the book in three parts, which says, so the first part is where we are now, well, oh, sorry, where, we, where we've been and how we got here and the sort of history of the way marketing has has developed and sort of base settings of marketing. Then there's a sort of where we are now and you know what's good in the current ways in which brands connect with women and what's still falling behind and where in some places things are really falling short. And then the third bit is the um, where we go next and that is sort of 10 principles or uh, provocations uh, which a mixture of of research findings case studies interviews perspectives and insights from our research which try to uh, set out some ways of thinking to help things get done in a in a better way in the future so that is it in it so that it wasn't even in a nutshell was it but anyway that's the that's the the gist of it all yeah and it's a fantastic book philippa and it's fair to say that it's one of these books that until you read it, you don't actually realize how much we are indoctrinated into this uh, a perspective that still very much dominates business. And I mean, it was making me think of the way that we look almost sort of pityingly on sort of North Koreans, so that oh, they couldn't know any different because it's all they've been told. But really, that's the same as the way that women have been marketed at and until it's almost pointed out to us we don't realize how much we are being uh directed in a different manner and told mm -hmm. you use this term a lot the good girl maybe you yeah. could elaborate on that little term and how you you know we're still too much of the good girl yes well, what yes, does yes. that mean philippa what are you saying yes. okay well that's the, that's the kind of central um Thesis, uh, a hypothesis really in the first part of the book which examines how we got here and and uh, the, basically the good girl put in uh, I really will try and do this one in that, you know, is that the, the, the sort of thesis is that in a world where it is still mostly men who are mostly in charge most of the time women are relegated to a position where culturally and often individually they need to behave in ways that are pleasing to men. And they need to, in order to access the sort of power and authority and privilege that men hold, women need to conform to a kind of secondary status where they are behave in a way that is agreeable and pleasing um, and in order to access that, that, that sort of power. And we call it, we call it the good girl and it's basically, you know, from the from the very word go uh, go in women's lives, the good girl is a sort of primary um, piece of conditioning that happens, uh, you know, from the from the little sort of baby in the in the crib to the uh, adorable little you know daddy's girl who's playing in a miniature kitchen with her miniature dolls, through to the sort of teenager whose boy. Uh, abs uh, you know, obsessed through to, you know, when when girls get to sort of 12 and 14, uh, um, a, a cultural conditioning where the good girl has to be sort of pleasing to men and women and girls spend so much time thinking about their appearance and how they appear to, to boys uh, up to the sort of hot um, uh, date and then through to uh, the, per, you know, perfect, perfect mom 
And then actually what happens by the time you know, when women have had, had children and conformed to, to that sort of perfect mom ideal, then once they get to 40 or 50, the good girl uh, narrative says, no, you're, you're no longer of interest or you're no longer of use. So you, you can kind of drop out of the equation and women therefore become invisible. And I guess the thesis in the book is that the good, the, the good girl narrative is amazing, exactly as you say, this amazingly strong paradigm. Uh, and we're all on the receiving end of it all of the time, both men, both women, whether feminist or not, we're all on the receiving end of this, this good girl thesis. And marketing has spent an enormous amount of energy and investment in standing up for good girl and in fact painting in and perpetuating and coloring in the the good girl because of course the the sort of in the notion of the good girl is is a is a, a state where what women are and what girls are and what little girls are is never enough they always have to be better they always have to be more perfect they can always be more good they can always be more pleasing and of course that's a, a state that is replete with needs and brands and and products therefore exist to tickle up those needs and then and then to meet them so marketing has been very very sort of culpable in in perpetuating that myth which keeps women and girls in this secondary in this secondary um secondary position and as you say and we're all all on the receiving end of that all on the receiving end Philip. and for any of the people who joined us who are saying oh no surely you know that's all in the dark ages now and philip is talking about you know 1950s woman with her pinny um let's move into sort of away from the sort of blatant sexism which possibly it was historically and into the way in which what you said that you, what you were calling the sneaky stuff yeah. and the different ways in which products are marketed to women as opposed to I mean let's take toiletries for example it's a great example in the book uh the way that uh, face creams and all these toiletries are uh, promoted to the female with all this medical language and hyper this and you don't know what the hell they're talking about and then when we go to a similar product in the male market it's you know like uh, ebony and sort of cool man and just again let's talk a little bit about the sneaky stuff Philippa. Yes, of course, because 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 in the sort of, you're right in the 20th century it was already put quite above above the surface and you know the sort of ideals and the good girl ideals at each stage of life were really um, heavily played out and I guess now what 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 we're seeing is 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 in response to as a, you know as a response to modernity really what that 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 those old ideals still get played out but just in these ways that are more sneaky and and um surreptitious so for example we probably no longer see that very overt binary for him and for her but if it's not communicated overtly and explicitly it gets communicated implicitly and subtextually for example through uh, the colours that get used by brands. So the, the, the um, semiotics of the female brands still conform to that, those soft, um, quite recessive, pastely, gentle colours and the colours used in, in male brands and marketing are much more robust, dark, strong, full on, uh, full on colours. So, the, so the, the, the same thing is being communicated for him and for her. It's just being done in this kind of more, um, more subtle way. Um, other things that we, we see, so we used to have in the sort of old overt days that the brand would just sort of, uh, yes, of, often uh, talk in very sort of scientific um, terms telling women about the product and how they needed it and what was wrong with them and why they needed it. Now, the sort of that scientific medical voice has become much more the sort of voice of, a, of, of the shrink, that kind of um, silky voice, which says, actually, it's not 
it, it, you're, it's about your behavior and how you how you present and you can be at something you can be better than this you can be stronger than this and here's brand x in order to 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 be that so um then we see a lot of tokenism and this actually has got has got better actually since black, black lives matter but it remained when we did our content analysis it was certainly the case that the majority of presentations of women was still that archetype of uh, white slim pleasing sort of in personality terms passive in presentation and always kind of smiling and agreeable in in the way that they looked and that remained the the dominant presentation of women uh, and occasionally a, 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 a other a woman who was outside of that very um, narrow definition would be included, but almost included sort of for reasons of her exceptionalism. Quite often, and, and this, this motif is still really very, very strong, you see it all the time, a sort of lineup of women, which is very actually incredibly close to that sort of 1950s pageant of, you know, of, of women in their swimming costumes, but you, still that, 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 that visual of, of sort of perfect women, and then usually on the ends, some women who didn't conform to that to, to that role. So literally kind of token appearances. So those it's those kind of subtle um, sneaky things that that um, that go on and give the pretense that everything has moved forward. But actually, the same messages are being communicated just in a kind of subtextual and and, and more sneaky and arguably are harder to point out sort of a way. Yeah, because they're hidden. And also from your research, Philippa, fr from, you know, this is the message that's being conveyed, but also your respondents told you that a very large number of them felt they didn't even connect with that advertising. They didn't see yeah. themselves and it uh, wasn't, they weren't seeing themselves in advertising, didn't connect with it. Yes, that, that's that's right, uh, and 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 actually worse that uh, um, big vast swathes of women actually completely overlooked by advertisers. So women who are uh, women of colour, older women, poorer women, often just not appearing at all in communications, and therefore having no chance of seeing themselves. So um, so it's just it's not just that the there's a lack, of, a lack of connect with the audiences that there are. There are lots of audiences who are just overlooked entirely. Uh, but all is not lost, is it, Philippa? No. As you go no. on in the third part of the book where you uh, say where we go next and sort of in a nutshell, uh, you're saying to the advertisers, to the brand leaders, no more telling. You need to earn the respect of of women in order to get them to uh you know connect with you and feel that you're on their side yeah that, that, that and that that's it that's exactly right and i guess the shift that we from the three parts of the book if if, if we were to you know we, to try and sum it up in the old school world the brand appeared as the master telling women what to do and how to behave in this kind of stage we're at now the brand sort of appears as a patron seeming to ally with women but actually still telling them that what they are is not enough and that they need to change and what we're saying in the uh, new era that is that that brands need to consider them, themselves not as master not as patron but as servant they're there to serve the audience to help help women and to be on, on side with them they basically need to get back in their box and stop telling women who they are and how to be and how to behave but just get on with the business of serving them fantastic i mean there's huge swathes of the book that i've underlined i nearly underlined one whole chapter i think and and you've just used that phrase which i actually wrote down here they need to get down from on high and back in their box, which I absolutely loved. Um, so Philippa, you've given a really good sort of rundown of the theme of the book now for any of the members who've joined us who are interested in uh, reading more about this subject. And I'm gonna hand over to Prakash now uh, to 
uh, put his questions to you. But thanks so much I'm, for I'm that so great sorry. introduction. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I'm so sorry that James got, she's texting she'll, me. She'll jump in, I'm sure, when she's, she's uh, got some, some in and out. Internet trouble, so she's, but she's trying, she's trying to get back in. Thank you uh, so much, Louise. Uh, Philip, I'm sure whenever she joins in, uh, I'll add her up, then we will get on the spotlight and we'll have our questions ready for us. Uh, meanwhile, I see a, a good amount of new people have joined in today. I want to give a quick shout out to um, Ashay, Asay Tejwani out here, uh, to Bharti Kejriwal, uh, LOI, LOI Beniti. Uh, there's God of God of Karki out there. And uh, <clears throat> I think there's also uh, Mini and there is, uh, I think even Palashi is like here for the first time, if I'm mistaken, all one of the first times, right? So people who have just joined us, uh, Vaishali Grover, uh, Ketan, uh, please feel free to uh, put your, your cameras on, go into a gallery mode if you want, find people you want to connect with, ping them, share your email IDs, share your LinkedIn IDs, because uh, that's an important uh, thing we do at this club. We make new friends personal and professional both. So please do that. Uh, have your questions ready and put them up at the you know, chat box. And at some point of time, Louis is gonna help us with picking up the right question. Don't mind the background noise. Uh, work from home, family, kids and cats, right? <laughs> so all of that, please bear with me. Um, Philippa, I was listening to you talk about, uh, you know, your experiences. And I know you have, have, you have a fantastic experience with the ad world, like years into it. Uh, I have a daughter, she's five years old, and uh, you want to, you know, once you're a parent, you want to do your best to raise a child in the right way. So one of the things you do is you start, start looking at stories, right? And mm. suddenly Cinderella, uh, the ending becomes problematic for you because at the end of it, she needs a prince to come into her life and rescue her from her you know, stepmother and her evil stepsister. So the story I told, me and my wife told my our daughter was, so at the end of it, she says, thank you to the prince, but I'm going to find a job. I mean, you know, and then like she finds a job and becomes this independent woman. She does her stuff, right? So you start modifying all the different stories that you, that you have because you want to uh, teach her something. And today when she's five, my daughter, uh, the stereotype she and her friends share is girls like pink, girls like yeah. dolls, yeah, boys like guns. Yeah. Uh, and she enjoys boxing, but girls don't enjoy boxing, right? And it is surprising because you try to control the inflow of information or pop culture to her. And she's five. And for the last two years, she's can't find the house. I mean, it's a pandemic. Yeah. So the question I'm bringing to you is, uh, what is happening? How much of a, a, is it a question of the male gaze dominantly driving narrative number one and number two, there are, I mean, half of us are women, right? What's happened to their point of view? Where is their story? Where is it going? Well, I mean, you're, 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 um, you're so right that once you, you know, once you become aware of this, this good girl narrative and how, you know, the, the sort of notion that men, are in charge most of the time and women are there for, and women and girls cast into these roles where they are dependent, have to be dependent, pleasing, passive, agreeable, look like men want them to look like. Once you kind of, once you see that narrative, it, you know, it really is absolutely everywhere and it's deeply, deeply wired into, into culture and, and is played out in all the, all the, the, um, fairy tales and and stories, uh, as you exactly as you say, and alongside the good girl, there's also the sort of narrative of the bad girl, which is the sort of you know a a, a, a narrative that goes runs alongside to keep the girl good girl in her place. You know, that if you don't conform to the to the good girl model, then you will fall off. You'll become the ugly sister. You'll become the evil stepmother, and so on. So there's these, these, and these narratives are, as, uh, are, are, are deeply, deeply ingrained. And I guess to your question about, about, about where, where we go next, uh, the first sort of principle in, our, in the third part of the book is what to do next, is that we say you've got the, you know, the, the marketing and 
culture generally needs to dismantle what we call the bell curve, which is this idea that female life is a sort of bell, you know, shaped as a bell curve, and that the height of the bell curve is marriage and children and having children, and everything up to then is a sort of rehearsal or uh, audition for that role, and everything afterwards is a sort of decline into into irrelevance and invisibility, and and. Brands have been very, very guilty of perpetuating and underscoring and colouring in that bell curve. And so the sort of first part of kind of putting it right is, is dismantling that. It's not, it's not how women see their lives and it's not how they want to live their lives either. And actually, all, in all, all our research, women tell us that the, their female let life... Let me jump in here because... You start about the shape of of the, let me jump in here, Afrilipa, uh, because you... you almost brought me to this next question, which I have in mind. And, and I hope uh, Jane can take it. Jane, I, I know you've been having connection problems, but this next question yes, then becomes, hi, I hope you can hear us and, and, and hi from all of us out here, Jane. Um, the question is, uh, you know, we are soaked. I mean, this world is full of the whole male gauge right now, right? But uh, how would the world, what does the female gauge entail? How is that world like? Well, we, we, can you hear me? Is this, am I, can it, is it working? Yes, we can. This is working really. Yeah, it is. Okay, so the, the, the well, I mean, I, sub I suppose what we would say is that the, the female gaze has become more prevalent over the last probably five to 10 years, partly facilitated by social media, um, which obviously is a real double-edged sword for women because it's not a particularly safe space for women, but it has been a way of disintermediating male editorship of you know female priorities and interests and as a consequence you've seen and heard much sort of louder bolder more forthright female voices coming to the fore on social media um, and I guess what we've seen in a commercial context is female gaze brands so brands that have been you know brought invented by women brought to market by women again facilitated by the web because the kind of male run retailers have been in disintermediated and they've been able to do develop d2c relationships in a way that um that they haven't been previously and what you see are brands like frida mom who um present motherhood not as this sort of perfectionist ideal that everyone has to women have to live up to and if they don't live up to it then they're a failure but properly sort of empathizing with the challenges and the joys of early motherhood um, and and on on the back of that MP, empathy and on the back of some amazingly sort of empathetic product ranges being able to um, connect with a female audience in a way some of the traditional brands haven't been able to so there has been a sort of a breakdown to a degree of the sort of stranglehold that the male gaze has had both on culture and media channels and on brands and commercial entities um, brought about by social media, brought about by direct to consumer channels, brought about, about by, and I see somebody's mentioned sort of economic models, traditional economics, brought about also by the really interesting alternative economic models from Kate Raworth with, you know, donut economics and the kindness economy from Mary Portas, um, but but female economists also rising to the surface in this new context and um, creating economic models that take into account female contribution to the economy because currently it's not even really included in GDP, is it? Female contribution, it's largely sort of ignored and um, and. Uh, you know, and I mean, literally not counted and metaphorically not counted. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I want to bring in, uh, uh, I want to do, I want to open it up for q and but before we do one, one story, which I want to share, and I want to possibly get some stories back from you, connected to this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, till a few years back, we were also creating ads as a company, Thousand One Stories. And I remember this one time around Mother's Day uh, for a particular brand. And, you know, the idea is just we're trying to decide the right script. Your planning is done. You're trying to decide the right script. And my co-founder, uh, you know, she's there, right, with, with the story ready, with the script ready. 
uh, the brand managers, they're all women, right? Three of them, they're there in the story, right? And it's around, uh, it's dealing with this whole guilt mothers have typically with a stereotype saying, how do I let go of you, my, my child, you're trying to grow. And the story is around the girl saying, it's okay, mama. I'm going to go and live my life. You don't have to feel the guilt. And so it ends on that note, right? Uh, around the workspace, you know, there's the whole story trying to build. And uh, all of them love the, the story. And that film never went out because uh, without releasing too much information, uh, the super was out there who had to approve it was a man. And his idea of what a mother is and a mother's point of view towards women, what women are supposed to be, Mm. It didn't permit for that story to go out. He said, no, women are not like that. Yeah. And it was funny because the other four people in the room are women. They're like, no, we are women. We know how this is. But, yeah. uh, you know, the highest person, uh, paid person's opinion, hip hop, what do you call it, right? It, it, it took yeah. uh, the dominant voice. And so the story which went out was this whole, you know, usual typical, stereotypical mother daughter story. And what have been your experiences around this? I, I know that advertising and marketing is a boys club. It's pretty much a, a, a men's world out there, right? Yeah. We've seen changes over the last two, three decades. It is still the same. Is there hope or like, you know, you have to give up some there, 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 I think there definitely is hope. And I think one of the great things about the female brands coming to the fore is that they are leading by example, and they're demonstrating that you can be successful by telling the truth of the female experience rather than basically presenting women as men would like women to be. Um, so I'm sure that gentleman in your meeting would really like women to be very happy to be perfect mothers, dedicating their lives to their children and nothing else, but that isn't necessarily what all women, all women want. And so there, there are these brands with, that are sort of demonstrating that you can be successful by telling the truth. And there are more women in organizations who are leading marketing departments. Where there is a bit of stasis is in creative departments, which are still, for the most part, in most countries, led by, um, they're, they're basically led by, uh, led by men and they are dominated by men. And most CEOs are men. So you often have, even if you have a wonderful great, you know, marketing director who's female, she's sort of stuck between two, um, two men who often don't understand the actual experience of, of, of being a mother or any of the other life stages that women have to contend with. But there is hope, we think. Don't you think, Phil? Do you think there's hope? Are you hopeful? Yeah, oh, definitely. And there are lots of, I mean, I guess we probably come into a disproportionate contact with a disproportionate number of brands who want to do the want to do the right thing um but i think you know to return to louise's sort of point that she made right at the beginning you know everyone's on the receiving end of this stuff most people aren't doing it deliberately and and it's we find it increasingly rare that men are sort of closed to trying to understand new and better ways of of doing it it's just that because a lot of this stuff is so subtextual and often subconscious that it's it's difficult quite often well it's quite easy for the wrong thing to happen but the uh, on the whole the people that we work with anyway the intentions of and the hearts are really in the right place i'm bringing in louise here and before i go and we, we start the q a uh, just so that we also understand the other side of it it is uh, typically people who are in the world of advertising, branding, marketing are what you call the most liberal, typically in a group, they are the one who's supposed to be the most open to all kind of societal yeah. changes, right? So there yeah. is, it, it's very weird because on one side you have this group who are supposed to be very welcoming and open. And on the other side, you have all the stories coming out last four or five years ago on the whole Me Too uh, you know, scandals out there. It, it's, it's very difficult to understand how both can coexist and you can have stereotypes after stereotypes coming out. And at the same time, you also have the, the need to understand and voice out and create something like uh, that particular ad, I think, Run Like a Girl, which went quite viral sometime back. You know, uh, I, I hope someone will, will bring it up and we can touch it uh, in the next half of the discussion. Philippa Jane, thank you so much. Louise, all yours for the Q&A. Thank, thank, thank you so much.
Thanks so much, Prakash. And I've seen loads of great chat going on uh, at the side, having a good, good uh, laugh at Tony's comment about saying that guy had some <laughs> mummy issues. That's very <laughs> funny. And uh, I will just say before I bring in your questions that uh, one thought I had was reading the figures that Philippa and Jane shared in the book about uh, education and uh, girls are now outperforming. I mean, these are UK figures, of course, that girls are now outperforming boys in their educational achievements. Um, the number of girls taking science A levels overtook boys for the first time ever in 2019. So, presumably, from these developments, I mean, that's excellent because it will feed into academia that the female voice will come forward and potentially then become equal, replacing what is still a very male heavy and you know this is where we're fed down from above with our mm. teaching so I think we're very hopeful uh, in that respect mm. but uh, so uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Sonika you've put a couple of questions uh, in the chat box would you like to put one of them to Philippa and Jane Sonika yeah, hi. So my question was basically, a lot of times uh, when you're looking into the way things are marketed, it's always about uh, one woman versus another. So there's one woman who's doing it right and she's using this product and it's working well for her versus another woman who's making a mistake by not using this product. So doesn't that become slightly exclusionary to a certain kind of uh, perspective. And I, I saw this in terms of an advertisement for sanitary napkins where um, one woman who's using a sanitary napkin is now so energetic and active and playing tennis and things like that when that's not really a realistic scenario. That's not really how we're going to behave. That's not really how I want to behave. So that's, that's what I was thinking about that when this, um, dichotomy of perspectives within women itself as a group comes into play, then how do you deal with something like that? I mean, the, the, the notion of this sort of divided feminine is, is, is obviously really deep in our culture, isn't it? That, that there's sort of good women and bad women, as Philippa said, there's, you know, Britney Spears before and after, there's Meghan Markle and then there's Kate Middleton. They, there are all these sort of archetypes and narratives that are constantly sort of iterated throughout our culture to, to say that, and, it, and it's very helpful, I guess, in, a, in an oppressive um, in an oppressive regime to keep the people divided, which is what feminists would say is often happening in the subtext of those sorts of communications, which is you buy the right sanitary napkin, you're good. If you buy the wrong one, you're a bad, you're a bad girl, not a good girl. Um, I mean, what we try and focus on in our work when we're developing brand propositions and brand positionings and communications ideas with clients is to really get them to focus in on what's shared. So what's shared between them and their target audience, because what we, we, we talk about is, the, is this sort of really positive dynamic that happens in brand relationships with their female customers when they say, okay, they revolve around an interest. So it might be in the case of Dove, it might be a belief in real beauty, or in the case of Freedom Mom, it might be about really helping moms through that really difficult sort of first six months of, of having babies. And then, and then demonstrating that you have a really huge shared understanding of what it's like to be in that place. Yeah. So it's never critical. It can't be critical because you're so deeply empathizing with the audience. Um, and by and large, that the audience will have a very shared relationship or, or a shared experience with each other around these things as well. Um, so the, the sort of notion of the divided good women by A and bad women by B feels so anachronistic. And, he, and now even, I mean, very few women kind of will we'll put up, you know, if you show women ads like that now in research, certainly in the research that we do, they're highly sensitized to being criticized in that way. And, and in that notion of, you know, the brand telling women who's good and who's bad and being in charge of the, of the sort of judgment, I suppose. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. Thanks so much, Sonika. That was a, that was a great question. And um, just before we go, into chat again for the uh, other questions. Maybe a little bit about, as we're talking about these two types of women, maybe we can talk about the, the age at which, Philippa, you say suddenly women become invisible. 
you know, this, this group is the biggest and fastest growing consumer audience. We're talking about sort of 45, 50 plus, and you say, and you talk about the token Helen Mirren appearing over and over again. Um, yeah. You're absolutely right. This is a, this is an invisible group. I just took a random magazine and flicked through, and sure, there were a few old uh, silver foxes in there, which I didn't mind looking at, but there certainly was not one woman over what I would guess. I estimated sort of over 40, which is, that was my irate letter. But uh, tell me a little bit about that, Philippa. Yeah, so when we when we did our, our content analysis for, for the for the book, we thought, I think it was only in ads that included women, only one in 10 had a had a woman who was over over 40. And and actually what happens is under under that sort of, um, you know, bell curve narrative, uh, uh, where a woman is, is no longer of interest or relevance when she's no longer of use, of use to men after um, having had children and had a family and looked after them, she becomes, becomes irrelevant under that old narrative. Um, and that's why we see the literally the, that that age group are the invisible women in, in, in marketing. And they just literally don't appear, or if they do appear, either it's Helen Mirren or they're there in a almost in a kind of you know in a very that sort of very tokenistic thing we were talking about at the beginning. You know, oh look at her, look at us uh, uh, as a brand, aren't we? You know, inclusive because we put an older woman in there. You know, it's it's very sort of very clunky and and uh, extremely patronising in that sense. Um, so. There is, though, because some quite a lot of uh, quite interesting change in that. In that, the, the world suddenly seems to be waking up to this. And in the last, probably in the last, I don't know, three or six months, we've seen a whole lot more discourse opening up around older women and around the menopause and around older women at work and older women as a consumer audience because. You know, because they're so so valuable uh, as a uh, as a sort of target audience. So we are seeing we are seeing some quite good and hopeful change. Hopeful change there. It's just when you look at the moment, it seems it does seem incredibly um, regressive. Thanks, Philippa and um, Kathleen. I hope you don't mind if I invite you in. I've seen you've made a few comments in the chat box, and I'm only in inviting Kathleen in because. Kathleen was the one who encouraged me to read uh, Invisible Women in the first place. Uh, Kathleen, are you uh, quite hopeful for the future of advertising to women? <laughs> uh, well, yes, because I see um, Gen Z being very different in their attitudes. And like I put in my comment, like Disney princesses, have changed. <laughs> they they do not need a man to help and save them. They will save the man. And I think that, you know, Rakasha's daughter has, you know, she's going to be, she's going to save herself. She'll save her dad, you know, at some point in the future. So I do see improvement, but it is, it is, it's a struggle because there are a lot of entrenched male conservative attitudes that do not want to lose their power and they that one of their powers is having power over women deciding how women should be deciding who they how they should look how they should behave and once you hit menopause we don't need you anymore so you know why should we why should we look at you or talk to you so yes your your book and um invisible women yeah you know we got to we got to get that information out there. Thanks, thanks, Kathleen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. And um, I, I mean, I don't know from some of the uh, men joining us for today's event. Um, I, I'm kind of curious. I mean, this is no by no means meant to be a sort of blaming blaming game you know the fact is everybody wants to work together and I'd be really interested to hear the viewpoints of some of the 
uh, men who've joined us today, whether they're feeling sort of like, oh, I shouldn't say anything or, um, you know, if I put my viewpoint, I don't want to come over as a dinosaur. Uh, maybe I can invite you in, Tony, to make a comment about how you're feeling uh, at a conversation like this. So, so you want a man to talk about his feelings. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Tony. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's really kind of interesting because, uh, you, you know, I have a couple of thoughts. One is advertising is, is meant to, to create dissatisfaction with yourself with the status quo, you know, my, my breath smells bad. So I've got to use the white, the right uh, mouthwash or, you know, deodorant or whatever. So th I think that's, that's kind of the role of advertising is to have you strive to fit a certain ideal. And, you know, we have quote, quote unquote, the good girl ideal, but we also have the, the Marlboro man you know, striding across the plains of, of Western America. Yeah. So, so, you, you know, I mean, how, it's almost like, how can you use advertising or marketing to change, to change those roles? How can you challenge those roles that we're mm -hmm. all kind of forced to, to be in both men and women? I think the system is sort of set up that we're all expected to meet certain certain expectations, there's certain expectations for both men and women. And those can be, you know, disempowering and empowering, depending on who you are and what you want to do. But but I think marketing is, is sort of set up to, to exploit that. So how can you use marketing to defeat marketing, I guess, is kind of my <laughs> question. I suppose one, one sort of initial, initial um, uh, Sort of thought around what what you've just said. I mean that is that is true that that marketing is in this business of of um, setting out aspiration and encouraging the audience to meet it. Of, of course, but there is a distinction in what happens between the way it gets done for women and the way it gets done for men. Is that that the way it gets done for women is that women are made to feel bad about what they're not and how they're failing and falling beneath the ideal. And on the whole, men are made to feel good with the ideal. The Marlboro man is, is a positive, rugged success who strides the earth. Whereas in fe the female discourse, it tends to be much more about what you are is not enough and you need to change. So, the, so it's done. It's done slightly. It, it, that, that that presentation of ideals is done is done slightly is done slightly differently. And and I think also what what I think certainly that that kind of brilliant business model of which marketing has sort of um, yielded great returns from, which is make people feel bad about themselves and sell them some products and services that will make them feel good about themselves again but never make them, never make the ideal actually achievable because then they'd have to stop buying the products and services. I think that that sort of business model has been quite prevalent, but it does, I mean, I think certainly a lot of the marketing directors that we deal with now, and, and when you listen to the discourse in, in marketing and within actually most big businesses, they recognize and acknowledge the damage that's done in creating those unachievable ideals, particularly for, particularly for girls and for women, but also you know, for men as well, the idea of having to live up to the strong, silent, hero, heroic, rogue sort of model is is um, very limiting and can be very debilitating and create lots of problems from eating disorders to depression, you know, for both genders. And I think just as I think companies and commercial entities are beginning to wake up to bigger social responsibilities like the environment, so too are they starting to wake up to the idea that you can't be going around making people feel really shit about themselves and and not expect to, it to come back at, come back at you at some point and because it's now been proven that there's a very straight line between marketing and that kind of marketing and eating disorders and people feeling um feeling like they've got low sort of self-esteem there's no getting away from it really now and that and that I mean Unilever has been very front-footed on that on that I guess kind of proving the link between the two and 
so they can't re it's very difficult for for them to continue now well it'll be it'll be interesting to watch that evolution because i haven't yeah. you know as a consumer of marketing yeah. i haven't really seen that you know yeah. um and, and I'll just finish with a, a really funny little story. Uh, I have two children, a daughter, a daughter and a son. The daughter is older. Um, so when he, the son came along and we put him in daycare, we had lots of frilly, uh, flowery clothes. And we would dress him up, take him to daycare. And inevitably, he would come back with the more masculine replacement clothes that we had sent along. So, <laughs> so it starts early, Prakash. Yeah. It starts really, yeah. really early as we get, all of us get kind of pressed into this, this societal yeah. system. Yeah. And it's actually at the age of eight is when it's pretty firmly established. It's kind of once children have been in education for, you know, for a number of years, by the age of eight, um, children will say that being a girl, being a woman, being feminine is about being weak affectionate, pleasing, being masculine is about being strong, confident, bold, adventurous. And it becomes very sort of binary and very sort of um, very sort of fixed very quickly and very young. And then, of course, you have all of the culture then compound as, as they get older. Thanks so much for that uh, uh, contribution, Tony. I really appreciate it. Um, and also, I'd like to, if um, uh, Lashazar is with us, Lashazar, are you there? You wanted to ask Philippa and Jane. I think you mean, uh, I mean, they're researching themselves. I think you meant uh, examples they've seen. Are you with us, Lashazar? Yep. Uh, I hope you guys can. So my yeah, question, we can hear you. Go ahead, Lashisa. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so my question is related to your work, and I was wondering what are the best examples and best campaigns that you have had so far and have produced for clients, and maybe also an example of of of, of piece of work that you're not so proud of, and when where things went wrong or I mean, we, not as expected. We sure we don't we don't make i mean we're not an agency so we don't make commercials or make campaigns i guess so um our work is is um is strategic and pre pre predominantly well it's nearly all research so um so we probably can't answer the question quite as it's asked but we can certainly i mean we would say that the best examples now are the ones that are coming out of those kind of female made brands brands like bumble starling probably Glossier, 13 Loon, brands that have been created by women, often for women or for a male and female audience. And then the work, and, and even things like body form, I think are really interesting, the way they're kind of reconstructing the way the market gets discussed out of a sort of hushed, whispered, you know, denial narrative, let's keep it in the female community and under wraps into something much more sort of bold and interesting. And then the worst, I don't I think yeah, what, 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 this is, I guess, best and worst is, um, I suppose the, um, and it was be, it's been in the, um, in the press quite a lot that, this week, hasn't it? It's Victoria's Secret, which for, mm. for so long was the kind of classic um, male gaze, male pleasing um, uh, brand, you know, producing um, underwear for women that sort of assumed that it was all about the viewer rather than the wearer. And, uh, you know, there's those astonishing kind of good girl narratives that got played out in all that stuff that they used to do around the, you know, the, the catwalk show and everything. And then and then there's that, that brilliant brand, which you may have seen called, called um, Third Love, which was founded by a woman called Heidi Zack, which um, is all about but just women being comfortable in their own skin. And in, in, the, in the one of the, in the quantitative study that we did, that I talked about at the beginning, where when we asked women what their aspirations were, you know, if you looked at marketing, you would say appearance, but bound to be, must be, is the thing that women mind about most. And actually being comfortable in their own skin was the thing that women minded about most. And, and Third Love have reflected that so beautifully in, the, in that brand and the, and the way in which it presents. And it's, I think it just says to each, it's to each their own. And this, you know, uh, and it's all about underwear 
for the wearer, not not for the not for the viewer. And so the Victoria's Secrets and Third Love is a really good sort of side by side dramatization of the bad and the um, and the progressive and positive. We think. Thanks so much. Good question. Thank you, Lashes. And um, we're getting towards the end of um, the session today, but I don't want to finish without just talking about the, um, uh, the, the you can have it all fallacy, which drives me absolutely bonkers. And uh, you used a great quote in the book from Michelle Obama when she was promoting her book. I tell women that whole you can have it all. No, not at the same time, it's a lie. It's not always enough to lean in because that shit doesn't work all the time. I mean, this this whole thing of, uh, you know, being told you can have it all and uh, I think maybe has really culminated during lockdown because we haven't even mm. been able to run away to the office and leave somebody else to be responsible <laughs> for everything else. So, um, yeah, maybe you just talk a little bit on that. I can see you nodding, Jane. Well, it's, I guess it's one of the one of our objections to the whole sort of fem empowerment and fempertizing movement really is that it is like the sort of marketing arm of corporate feminism, which is the Sheryl Sandberg lean in thing that if women are just motivated enough, if they would just kind of lean in enough, have a bit more energy, be a bit better, usually be a bit more like men, then everything would be all right and they'd all succeed, glass ceiling shattered, women at the top of every organization. Um, uh, leaving it up to women really to do all the work and to and to make make changes about you know in themselves in order to fix the problem where of course the problem isn't in women the problem is in the way the system works and what it values and what it prioritizes what it rewards what it encourages and um, who it promotes and why why it promotes those individuals so um so i think i think our, our worry is with fem empowerment and fem fempertizing even though it has done some really good good things in terms of creating better more more representation in particular around women not just in terms of ethnicity but in terms of appearance um at the end of the day it still is telling women quite often just to change themselves you know so now it's not be thin be brave you know it's not be beautiful it's um be strong you know strong is the new pretty it's all the it's all the same thing which is basically brands telling women to change themselves to be better in some way often to be a bit more like men but it's also leaving it up to women saying the problem is with women <laughs> the problem isn't with the with the system and that and um so so i think that that's our sort of that's why we take issue i guess with advertising and empowerment and that the it, it doesn't what it doesn't do is tackle the systemic problems which is exactly why we've seen what we've seen over the course of the pandemic which is um, of course, that lots of things have slipped backwards because the deep roots um, of the system aren't yet accommodating of the needs of women and the needs of mothers. And so you ended up with lots of women losing their jobs um, or having to change their jobs quite significantly in order to accommodate the pandemic. While the same, while obviously lots of men were hit by the pandemic as well, it wasn't to the same degree which sort of demonstrated to us the sort of shallowness of the answer, which is lean in, you know, you work it out, you, you just juggle, juggle the complexity and everything will be fine. And but it isn't fine. Yeah. And I mean, the thing is, it's not just men, you know, we, we at times are just as guilty ourselves of reinforcing. I mean, I have three daughters and a son, but I hear myself saying to them, that's not very ladylike. You know, we're indoctrinated in with this, uh, you know, and then I question myself, you know, uh, and then they have to tell me. And so this is all an age thing and the language we're using. I mean, it's, ju it's not just advertising. It's not just mm -hmm. marketing. It's our no. whole, really, our whole society. And we as much indoctrinate other mm. women and, and judge them. I've been told to judge them. You know, yeah. as you say, you're not a good enough mother or, you know, you know, all these ways in which I suppose we undermine each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we're, and we're, uh, you're so right that everyone's, everyone's on the receiving end. And there are very few people now who are doing this stuff in a, in a sort of conscious or deliberate way. It's, it's just in, it's in the, in the woodwork of 
um, of you know how things happen, and that's why you know pulling it out into the light and exposing it is so important, isn't it? Because otherwise, we it just goes past unseen and and unnoticed. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Philippa. And um, I could talk on this for much longer, but we are out of time. And uh, this is one of the joys of having this group is being able to read things like this. And, you know, at my age, to be re-educated, you know, to be exposed to new ideas is absolutely fantastic. We're exposed to new ideas every single week that we join together here. So um, I'm always so pleased and grateful for all of you for joining us. So thank you very much, uh, all of the members who join us and who message us. And uh, I'm just gonna hand back to Prakash to wrap up and say thank you so much, Philip and Jane. It's an absolute joy talking to you. Thank you. Oh, thanks for having us. Sorry about all my technical rubbish. Oh, and thank you so much to everyone for, um, for um, your in really interesting and thoughtful questions. And, and thanks to all the, the men who've come to us you know so often we do these talks and there's one bloke who sort of has, co has come along and and i'm sure feels completely sort of um, surrounded so it's wonderful that in your lovely open-minded group there are loads of blokes who who want to think about it all as well a very unusual group well done <laughs> thanks so much uh, Philippa Jane, for people who turn in uh, all of us, new journeys. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, something is very uh, something is happening in India right now. Uh, before we go, uh, three things. Number one is typically, uh, you know, we, someone talked about sanitary pads that, that that reminded me, the go-to color for the liquid being used in demonstration is blue. And I've just been told by someone that uh, she uh, saw red color being used. And then the question then is, why were we using blue till now? Who was it offensive to, to the women yeah. or to the men? Who was finding it uh, you know, troublesome? So uh, it, it, that is going to be something you want, I think we in India want to watch out for, number one. Number two, we've seen an explosion of fintech companies in India around money, around insurance. And this <laughs> is the place where you know now you know women as, as consumers have money. So you want to talk to them, but this is not a beauty product. This is not lingerie. This is money. So you don't have, I think, category code, category codes set. How do you talk to women? What is the mm. archetype of women out there? I think it might be interesting to see how how advertising communicates to women out there. And the last of it is uh, this Netflix movie which dropped yesterday. It's an Indian movie. It's called Hasina Dilruba. Uh, fantastic women, something like that, right? And yeah. what's interesting about this movie is people either love it or hate it absolutely. And uh, it's because it turns the conventional idea of what a woman, a good woman is a bit around. Uh, what happens in the story, and, and I'm giving out some spoilers around and it connects, is that uh, she marries this guy, uh, falls in love with his cousin, has a relationship with the cousin. The husband finds out some bit of drama. She so kind of you know, falls for the husband. And at the end of it, it's a thriller also. He, he kind of becomes okay when he falls in love with it. It's not forgiven fully, but he kind of falls in love with her and they kind of do some crazy stuff together. Like, you know, it's like a whodunit kind of a thing. Yeah. Beautifully shot. And, and the guy actually, the director comes from the ad world. Uh, Vinil, I think his name, Vinil Matthews, if I'm not mistaken. And the reason, one of the reasons why people absolutely hate it is because it turns this stereotype of what is supposed to be a good woman. A good woman is supposed to be, fill in the blanks, pure, only for me, right? And so the idea that the protagonist in this movie becomes okay with not his girlfriend, but his wife having a fling with someone, forgives her, accepts her, and actually commits crimes to save her and protect her. It is something very difficult to digest right now. But the fact is a movie like this has been made. And mm. it's interesting what happens 10 years from now. Philippa and Jane, yeah. before you go, what can we do to make this journey easier? Men, women, both out here. What can we do? Last words. Um, I, I'd say be really um, 
really aware of those uh, hidden, you know, hardwired in the woodwork narratives that we're all on the receiving end of. And once you're aware of them, it's much easier just to sort of navigate around them or displace them or contradict them. But you have to know that they're, that they're there. And so being aware of that stuff, I think, is the foundation of change. And then I think it's probably inspiring yourself, you know, kind of looking at the brands that do it well, those women made brands that we discussed, you know, looking at the alternative to the male gaze so that there is a, there is a blueprint out there, there is a way of doing it that's different. You know, it, it can feel like we're all very stuck, but given that some people have managed to unstick themselves, um, it's certainly worth looking at what they're doing and how they're doing it. Thank you so much, uh, Philippa Jean, Louise, everyone. Um, absolute pleasure as always. Stay safe. Take care. It's almost done. I'm sure we are more than halfway done the pandemic. Let's so, hope so. Take care. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Bye now. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Sebastian, for joining us.